Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Abby, and I am Gamut's current acting and teaching intern. And I'm going to talk to you about some Shakespeare today. So what I want to talk to you about is my favorite category of Shakespeare plays, and those are the problem plays. Now, odds are you probably haven't heard the term problem play before, and that's totally fine if you haven't. We're gonna go over it, I'll talk to you all about it in a little bit. But first, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna go over the other categories of plays that you may have heard of, uh, just to get us all up to speed. So, there are three main categories of Shakespeare plays, and those are the comedies, tragedies, and histories. Now, our comedies are plays like A Midsummer Night's Dream and Twelfth Night, and those are plays that typically end in weddings. That's pretty much how you know a comedy is a comedy. If people get married in the end, odds are that's what it is. Now, tragedies are plays like Macbeth and Hamlet, Titus Andronicus, to name a few. And those are plays where lots of people die. If a lot of people die, especially right at the end, odds are it's a tragedy. Then we have our histories, and those are plays like uh, Henry IV, Part One, Henry IV, Part Two, Henry V. Henry the Sixth, Part One, Henry the Sixth, Part Two, Henry the Sixth, Part Three. There were a lot of Henrys and a lot, a lot of plays about Henrys that Shakespeare wrote. But they're about real people, real English kings. For lack of a better term, they are historical. The histories are about kings, more or less. So. If it's about a real person, odds are it's a history. Uh, there's a fourth category of plays that doesn't get talked about quite as often, and those are the romances. Now, the romances aren't romances because they're filled with all of this, like, love and all of these relationships and are very, like, Titanic-esque plays. They're not like that. They're romances because they incorporate these magical and mystical elements um, within them. They have all of these otherworldly things going on that keep them from being ground in our reality. And so while the romances often just get um, put under comedies and tragedies and histories, what sets them apart from other plays is that they really distinctly have magical things going on in them and those are plays like Pericles and the Tempest and the Winter's Tale. So that's kind of a basic overview of the well-known Shakespeare categories and all of his play plays can fit under the categories of comedy, tragedy, and history. Romances kind of takes it a bit further and then what takes it even further is like I said, my favorite category, the problem plays. Now, what makes a play a problem play is that those are the plays that focus on like very complex societal issues. And these are plays that, you know, they have elements of comedies, they have elements of tragedies, but they don't necessarily end in weddings. They don't necessarily have a lot of death in them. Um, but they do have enough of the kind of basics that go into those kinds of plays and that allows them to be filed under the category of like comedy or tragedy and like i said complex social problems um they're very psychological plays they have a lot to do with with what's happening internally with a lot of the characters they offer a lot of social commentary as well and so there are three plays that kind of fit specifically under the title problem plays. These are the ones that are defined by scholars as the problem plays, and they are Measure for Measure, All's Well That Ends Well, and Troilus and Cressida. And I'm gonna backtrack real quick, because like I said, very psychological. They very much focus on the human psyche, and they're very human at their core, these plays. They're very, very grounded in human reality more so than just kind of like the lackadaisical nonchalance of a play like Twelfth Night, for example. Um, that's more kind of fun and um, playful. Um, so like, for example, Troilus and Cressida. 
is a play that takes place during the Trojan War. And that is a play that, you know, focuses on the Greeks and the Trojans um, several years into this war. And there's a lot of commentary about, you know, what it means to live during wartime and the effect that that has on the soldiers fighting as well as the people that are just having to live with the fact that their country is at war. Um, there's also a lot of commentary in there about what it means to be a hero because, you know, we know characters like Odysseus, Achilles, Paris, and Hector from Greek mythology, and we recognize them as being very heroic, very lar larger than life. They are these incredible men with these feats that are astonishing. And then in Troilus and Cressida, Shakespeare just completely tears that apart and portrays them as very, like, gritty, down-to-earth, like, kind of terrible people. They're not who we think they are supposed to be, even though they ha they're heroes. They're the Greek and Trojan heroes, but not according to Shakespeare. And so that's just an example of how he kind of twists that structure that we're so familiar of with something like a history, for example, or maybe even a tragedy. And so it's something that has death. It's a play with death. There's a good amount of death in there. And there are romantic relationships between Troilus and Cressida, for example, but that isn't resolved at the end. It's very up in the air as to what happens between the two of them. And so it's not quite one or the other. It, it, there's a lot to be said about a play like Troilus and Cressida. It, it doesn't quite fit into what we expect it to in order to consider it like a tragedy. Now, what's really great about the term problem play is that it is a very ambiguous, vague kind of thing. Like, we do have our three defined, these three are problem plays. But just because we have those, there is debate um, amongst scholars as to other plays that could be or couldn't be problem plays. For example, some people say that Hamlet is a problem play. And there are arguments to be made for that. And there are arguments to be made against it, too. And so that's what I really like about this term because, you know, Shakespeare has so many plays and there are only three considered to be his problem plays, but you can argue for so many more. For example, I consider The Taming of the Shrew to be a problem play. And if you're unfamiliar, The Taming of the Shrew is about this woman named Kate, who is the shrew, who gets tamed by this man named Petruchio because she doesn't behave the way a woman should in her society and so there's a lot in that play about power dynamics between men and women and fighting against what's expected of you as a woman in a patriarchal society and we get to see a lot of like the internal struggle bet um, between Kate and Petruchio and there's a lot there. And so I consider it to be a problem play, even though it's not technically one of those three that scholars have deemed to be the problem plays. So that being said, I want to pose to you this question or this thought experiment more like. I want you to think about the Shakespeare plays that you know, and that might be a lot, that might not be very many, Either way is totally fine. I want you to think about the plays that you know, and I want you to think about whether or not the plays you know could be considered problem plays. So I want you to think about what happens in the society of those plays, what happens between the characters and those interpersonal relationships, and why might those plays be considered problem plays? Like I said, some people argue that Hamlet is a problem play. You can argue that. Um, you could argue that A Midsummer Night's Dream is a problem play, even though it's very much a run-of-the-mill comedy. So there are so many different arguments to be made for so many different plays. So I want you to think about that. Um, so yeah, thank you for considering this with me. I hope you're all doing well and taking care of yourselves. Take it easy and uh, yeah, have a good one.